Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you uh, all for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Lissa Muscatine. I'm one of the co-owners of Politics and Prose uh, with my husband, Brad Graham, and we are ecstatic and delighted to see so many people here. Wow, what an amazing crowd. Um, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, before we get started, I have a few little housekeeping things to, um, to talk about. Uh, the way this will work is, for those of you who are familiar with our events, what will happen is Roz will do her presentation, and then after that we'll take questions. We have two microphones set up on either side here. If you can get to the microphone, we do record and videotape these events, and it really helps to be able to hear the questions for those purposes. If for some reason you're wedged in the middle and you really truly cannot get up, um, maybe uh, Roz can repeat the question, if that's possible. Um, and um, we'll go on for about an hour or so. And I know that's a long time for those of you who are standing, but uh, I guarantee you it will be well worth it. I say with great confidence. Um, I'd also ask if you have a cell phone turned on, if you could turn it uh, to silent at the moment. And then at the end of the event, Roz will sign books. The, the signing line will start uh, to your right and my left, and it will go this way. So from here, out that way. If you could be kind enough to fold up your chair and put it to the side of the room, it will make everybody's life uh, much easier as we try to get through the signing. Now, I have a sort of good news and bad news housekeeping matter. The good news is that this book is uh, really taken off in, in great ways, which uh, is a commendable thing and a good thing for, for Roz. The bad news is that the publisher has run out of copies. Um, what that has meant is that, uh, it's sort of a good news, bad news. Uh, our staff has worked tirelessly over the past uh, few days to get copies of this book from every conceivable possible outlet available, um, near and far. And um, I've just been told by our events uh, coordinator that we have now sold out. So if you haven't gotten the book, unfortunately we have no more copies left. However, if you want to get it, uh, you can go to our information desk, we can take a special order, uh, and we will work with the publisher in hopes that we can get uh, signed book plates for the books, which isn't uh, ideal. Uh, it's not the same as actually being here, of course, and having the author sign it in front of you, but it's pretty darn close. And Roz has very generously uh, said that she will do her best to try to get as many signed as we can if you want to do a special order. So uh, keep that in mind as you think about that. Um, I think that's it on the housekeeping, and now for why you're all actually here. I just want to uh, say how delighted we are uh, to host uh, and welcome Raj Chasta Politics and Prose uh, for her wonderful book. It's called Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? Uh, Roz began at The New Yorker in 1978, and I think uh, from the size of this crowd and its enthusiasm, it's pretty obvious that she is widely regarded as one of the finest cartoonists in America. Uh, her fans, again... Um, <laughs> And I, I guess this is a, a minuscule fraction, as large as this crowd is, uh, of her fans. Uh, but I'm sure many of you, as I do, appreciate her ability to use her craft to examine human beings and the world they inhabit in ways that are at once funny, heartbreaking, wry, and droll. In addition to her New Yorker cartoons and covers, her work has appeared in Red Book, Mother Jones, and other publications. She's won numerous prizes, author authored several previous books of her own, and contributed to various collections. New Yorker editor David Remnick calls Roz Chast, and this is a quote, the magazine's only certifiable genius. <laughs> Can we talk about something more pleasant as a graphic memoir? In it, Roz tackles the often unspoken subject of what really happens when parents age and when their children become witnesses to the indignities, frailties, comedies, and lunacies that too often define the final stages of life. Roz is not just a great artist, she's a great storyteller. And this book takes us well beyond a notional or abstract story. Rather, it's a very intimate family story conveyed with cartoons, not surprisingly, but also with text, sketches, and even photos. No feelings are glossed over, no blemishes concealed, no truths denied, and the reader comes away with a graphic experience, and I mean graphic in every sense of the word, of how complicated familial love can be and how and why that love is often put to its greatest test when parents near the end of their lives. It is sometimes funny, it is sometimes comically dark, and it is sometimes just plain dark. Uh, but mostly it is a clear window on real life in its richest and most unvarnished dimensions. So thank you, Roz, for coming to PNP tonight, and welcome. Thank you. Um, um, well, I'd like to uh, 
is this this working? Okay. I like to start out my slideshow with um, this slide because it'll tell you, that's better, it'll tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from. Um, uh, many years ago, I was asked to send a photograph of myself to a magazine uh, of me at age nine. And I said, is it okay if I do a drawing instead? And they said, sure, you know, go ahead, knock yourself out. So um, I have me on the bed, I'm nine years old, I'm reading the big book of horrible rare diseases. <laughs> And uh, I'm surrounded by other books. Everything you always wanted to know about scurvy but were afraid to ask, uh, diseases of the tropics, a child's garden of maladies, um, lockjaw monthly. Lockjaw was for some reason in my childhood a very big disease and we were always afraid of it. I think it's sort of passed out of fashion. I don't know. Um, I don't hear kids talking about lockjaw anymore. But, um, and, and also the book that was sort of the, uh, the Bible in my house, which was the, the Merck Manual. <laughs> and the reason we had the Merck Manual is because my mother's, my mother, even though she was an assistant principal, um, her sister was a registered nurse. And so she would give us her outdated copies of the Merck Manual, which we always had lying around, which my mother would annotate and put like uh, newspaper articles about this disease or that disease. And, you know, when I would pick it up and sort of browse through it, 9, 10, 11 years old, I, most of it was way too technical for me. But I knew what symptoms were. I knew exactly what symptoms were. And I knew that leprosy was very rare in Brooklyn. But rare is not the same as non-existent. Um, so any kind of numbness, tingling in the fingers, you know. Um, anyway. Um, I'm going to show a few cartoons just to start before we get into the book. This is Pigeon Little. Um, the sky is falling. The sky is... Oh, look, part of a bagel. <laughs> what? Part of a table? Um, uh, this, is the, this is the fountain of puberty. Um, uh, this is when moms dance. Um, <laughs> And a lot of times people ask me, like, where do you get your ideas for cartoons? And so, most of the time I have no idea. But this particular one came from life. And I don't know if any of you um, have ever lived with a teenager, but there's almost nothing more disgusting to a teenager than the sight of the adult body. <laughs> and I really fully understand that. But if you really want to gild that lily of disgust, all you have to do is, like, if they're listening to some sort of hip-hop music or something, do a little dance. <laughs> and so my daughter was doing her homework, and she had some kind of music on, and I, like, came in. I wanted to see if she was paying attention, and I just did this little moving dance. And she said, Mom, stop. You're hurting me. <laughs> and it was such a good line. I said, can I use that? And she said, you know, go ahead. Um, it's very good sport. This is Urban Trail Mix. Um, <laughs> um, I'll read it for people who can't read it. It's uh, Tic Tac, Zoloft, Tylenol, Xanax, Nodos, Valium, Tums, and almonds. Very important protein. Uh, this is a not in the mood for human interaction line here. Um, this is how grandma sees the remote. We have uh, TV explodes. Cause nationwide blackout, tidal wave starter, loose sound, loose picture, launch rocket ship, house blows up, ominous smell, drop the big one. Um, and this is a obituary man, I think of him as. And, uh, and uh, I'll, for people over here, that the, the um, he's reading the obit page and it's two years younger than you, 12 years older than you, three years your junior, uh, exactly your age, five years your senior, and your age on the dot, which is like they were born the same month and the same year as you. It's not, not good. Um, this is just a, a antiques, collectibles, bric-a-brac, and garbage. Um, and uh, this is a, I like, um, the guy is a, I don't know if you guys can see it at all. It's, it's a, a statue gag, and it's a guy who died after a brave battle with everything. Um, and uh, this is uh, the cover of my new book. It's called Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? And um, it's about the, about the last 10 years of my parents' lives um, and my interactions with them and my doing my best, which was not always so great, to take care of them. 
this is a picture of, um, if I move like this, this, can you see any? Yeah, you probably can't. Um, of me and my parents, um, as you can see, they're a lot older than you. They're, you know, they, some people thought they were my grandparents. Um, uh, this is sort of goes back to the, the Merck manual. This is when I was growing up. My parents, I don't know, I think it was partly their background and partly that they were old enough to have seen many, many disasters. So they actually knew somebody whose husband was killed by a fl falling flower pot. They, they, my mother had a friend who was nearly blinded by mascara because the mascara. <laughs> um, they had a friend who traveled too much, jaundice. Um, friend's son killed by baseball, guy who almost died after playing the oboe. How, how might this have happened, you may ask? Well, let me tell you. My uncle was a jazz musician and he played the trumpet. So one time I overheard this conversation. He was telling my mother about a guy he knew who played the oboe. And one day he woke up and he was bleeding from every pore. And why was this? because evidently playing the oboe is very hard and it had something to do with the pressure of the playing the oboe and that caused him to bleed from every pore. There were other things that my mother would tell me, like she knew somebody who sat directly on the ground, like she put her butt on the ground without something in between butt and ground. She caught a cold in her kidneys and she died. <laughs> I was afraid to sit directly on the ground until I was about 12 years old. Um, also, swimming without a bathing cap. You might as well just, like, hang glide off a building. <laughs> because you get water in your ear, and that's the end. You, you, you go deaf. And, you know, when you're 16 years old, boys really like that look, you know, when you're wearing a bathing cap. Um, it, it's, it's hot. Um, laughing during a meal, choking, um, it, just too tight watch band. One time I found, I found a uh, bracelet, uh-uh, it was a little tight, it was an elastic thing, um, mm -mm, gangrene in your hand, hand drops off. Um, you know, a rash then dead, a headache then dead, a lump then dead. It was just, you know, this was, this was my parents' orientation. Um, my parents and I never discussed death. So, do you guys ever think about things? This is me talking to my parents. Um, and they're saying, what, what kinds of things? You know, things. Plans. I have no idea what you guys want. Let's say something happened. And then my mother is giving the universal sign for like, person is nuts, you know? <laughs> um, uh, am I the only sane person here? You know what? Never mind. Que sera, sera. Later that same day, there's me. I'm going, phew. And there's my father, phew. My mother, phew. It, you know, because I don't want to imply that I was the same person and my parents were resistant. It was really the three of us did not want to talk about anything. So I would sort of like tentatively dip my toe in like sort of dangerous waters. And as soon as I saw that they were resistant, I pulled that toe right out. Um, I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to talk about it pretty much any more than they did. Um, I was quite aware that my parents had had tough lives, way, way tougher than mine. You don't know what trouble is. <laughs> I had heard the stories my whole life about how their parents had come over from Russia at the turn of the century with nothing, about how my maternal grandfather had been an engineer in Russia, but how between his inability to speak English and his being Jewish, he wound up barely being able to support five kids and his wife working as a presser in the garment district, and how bitter and angry he was, and how my grandmother washed clothes for other people, and how even sadder my father's family was. His mother was one of nine children. Not only was she the only girl, but she was also the only one of her siblings to survive the Russian cholera epidemic which I thought this was an exaggeration on my mother's part because she did sometimes exaggerate, but I actually looked up Russian cholera epidemic and there was one at that time. <laughs> Who knew? Wikipedia said so. Um, then in a forest, her father had his throat cut from ear to ear by bandits. My mother told me this. I don't know what happened to her mother, but she came to New York, married my paternal grandfather, and had just one child, my father, by cesarean section in 1912, a horrible ordeal that involved, according to my mother, opening her up from her neck to her you-know-what. <laughs> 
between their one bad thing after another lives and the Depression, World War II, and the Holocaust in which they both lost family, it was amazing that they weren't crazier than they were. Who could blame them for not wanting to talk about death? And there's my father saying, let's discuss a more pleasant subject, which is where the title of this book comes from. It comes from my father. My parents referred to each other without any irony as soulmates. It's my mother saying, the rocks in his head match the holes in mine. <laughs> they were born 11 days apart, and they grew up two blocks apart in East Harlem, New York City. Tenements, we had nothing. They were in the same fifth grade class. He was the fat boy in the back of the room. Yep. They never dated, much less anything else, anybody besides each other. We were too poor. Plus, we lived with our parents until we were married. Aside from World War II, work, illness, and going to the bathroom, they did everything together. I'm going to Wallbaum's. Hold on, I'm coming too. My mother even washed my father's hair for him. It's not as if they never fought, because they did. Don't sit sideways, you're twisting your kishkas. <laughs> but the... <laughs> But the concept of looking for something better or being happy, that was for modern people or movie stars, i.e. degenerates. They were a tight little unit. Codependent? Of course we're codependent. Thank God. Maybe they believed that if they just held on to each other really, really tightly for eternity, nothing would ever change. And at a certain point, I well, for many years, I ignored going out to Brooklyn. I had moved from Brooklyn to Connecticut. I had two small children. I had a husband. I had a house. I had a job. And my kids were busy. You know what little kids are like. They've got to go here. They've got to go there. And it was just too hard to load everybody up into the car and go to Brooklyn. And I don't drive to New York. Um, I, this is like, this, you might as well ask me, like, Roz, why don't you just fly that rocket ship to the moon? It's like not going to happen. No, I did it once, and that was never again. And um, uh, anyway, I mean, I didn't learn to drive till I was 38. Whole other story. Um, but so it just seemed impossible. And for the 11 years, for 11 years, from um, like 19, I, I, can't, I can't do the math, for about 11 years, uh, in 1990, when we moved up to Connecticut, to 2001, I did not go into Brooklyn. If my parents wanted to come up and see the children and see us, they made the trip. Um, and then it was very easy to remember the date that this happened. Uh, September 9th, 2001, I have no idea why, but I had this intense urge to see my parents in their native habitat. I thought it was time. I suddenly, it was like suddenly, like this voice in my head said, you know, your parents are kind of old. And uh, so I visited them for the first time in years at their apartment in Brooklyn where I grew up. What I first noticed was the level of grime. What is grime? It's not ordinary dust or a greasy stovetop that hasn't been cleaned in a week or two. It's more of a coating, something that happens when people haven't cleaned in a really, really long time. One thing my mother always told me when I was growing up was, you have to dust. If you don't, the dust gets into all the interstices of the furniture and breaks it all apart. <laughs> it was clear that she had stopped worrying about that. But what do you do? If you pick up a sponge and start cleaning, and there's me, look at me. It's perfect, daughter. I have a little halo. It will not be necessarily perceived as helpful. The person you're trying to help might feel, even feel insulted or embarrassed. Put that down. Leave that alone. Don't touch that. Daddy and I are fine. And my father's, don't upset your mother. I wasn't great as a caretaker, and they weren't great at being taken care of. And around this time, I started to have these conversations with my mother and my father, but this one is about my mother. Uh, they were living in Brooklyn. I'm in Connecticut. And we talked on the phone. If I didn't see them, because um, I came down to Brooklyn every couple of weeks, but we talked on the phone all the time. So I um, talked to my mother. How's your cataract removal operation recovery coming along? <laughs> Great! It's like there was a yellow scrim over everything, and now it's gone. I still have the patch over the eye, though. <laughs> <laughs> but not to worry. There's plenty of food in the house. Daddy and I just got back from Wallbaums. I should air here. My father never learned how to drive. Period. I mean, I'm like one step ahead of him. Um, he was too anxious. And so my mother was driving. 
Mom, listen to me. You can't drive with one eye. You have no depth perception. Now, I don't know if any of you know Brooklyn or Ocean Parkway. This is a very wide avenue with many cars. I think it's either six or eight lanes, and I'm just thinking about my mother with a patch like this, you know, because she was a little old lady, you know, with this big old car, just kind of, and, uh, and she says, not a problem, Daddy guided me. Um, by 2002, they were 90. It was hard not to notice that every time I came to see them, the grime had grown thicker. The piles of newspapers, magazines, and junk mail had grown larger, and they themselves had grown frailer. I could see that they were slowly leaving the sphere of TV commercial old age. Spry, totally independent, just like a normal adult but with silver hair. <laughs> and moving into that part of old age that was scarier, harder to talk about, and not a part of this culture. And this is my little scientist going, extend the human lifespan to 140. Something was coming down the pike. It's no accident that most consumer ads are pitched to people in their 20s and 30s. I'm going to take up golf and tennis, so I'm going to need a lot of new stuff. Let's redecorate the house. For one thing, they are less likely to have gone through the transformative process of cleaning out their deceased parent's stuff. <laughs> Once you go through that, you can never look at your stuff in the same way. You start to look at your stuff a little post-mortemistically. <laughs> If, if you've lived more than two decades as a consumer, you probably have quite the accumulation, even if you're not a hoarder. An ergonomic garlic press, and throw pillows, and those stupid sunflower dessert plates, and seven travel alarm clocks, and eight nail clippers, and a colander, and a flat iron, and three old laptops, and barbells, and a set of fucking bocce balls, and patio furniture, and an auto harp, for God's sake, and your old flute from high school, and a zillion books, and towels, and sheets, and a walk you never used. Um, and this is a conversation I had with my mother. Now, my parents, as I said before, they grew up very, very poor. They were born in eight, 1912. What was it 1812? 1912. <laughs> um, and they also they graduated from college into the Depression. So there were all of these factors, you know, the, of waste not, want not. That was, you know, one of the mottos they lived by. They, th it, and in some ways, this, I think, was very admirable. I mean, they were like the sort of completely opposite you know, this, ins you know, to me, almost like insanely uh, consumer culture where, you know, you just buy new oven mitts because you're bored with the old one and you just bought the old one two weeks ago or whatever. Um, so this is, Mom, what is with this oven mitt? It's from the year one. <coughs> it's disgusting. It's all burnt and cruddy and it's got patches on it. <gasps> oh, my God. These patches come from a skirt I made 40 years ago in home ec. Please let me buy you an oven, a new oven mitt. And she says, why waste your money? That one still works. I mean, this is, the, she patched oven mitts. It's amazing. Anyway, um, so I, I had to clean out. When my parents moved to assisted living, I uh, had the job of cleaning out their apartment. And um, I took some things, you know, I took photo albums and things like that. And it was very strange. The whole thing was extremely surreal. I felt very weird going through their stuff, very deeply, deeply weird. Um, and I took photographs because I think in a lot of ways, I, I think one of the reasons why I write and I draw and I, and well, with these photographs is that I have such a horror of the way you just forget things. And for me, this is a way of remembering. Um, and these are, uh, some photos from, that are in the book. Um, my mother's glasses, the Museum of Schick Shavers, a stapler from probably pre-revolutionary -re war. Um, uh, the, uh, inexplicable things, like a, jar, a drawer of jar lids. You know, I don't know. I don't know why. Um, they were interesting installation art, I guess. I don't know. Um, I tried to get them to accept even a little bit of help from the outside. We don't need any help. They didn't want any strangers in the apartment. My mother insisted that no grocery store in Brooklyn delivered. And uh, occasionally one of their neighbors held out. I'm going to the store. Can I pick up anything for you? But the grime and disorder were worse than ever, way beyond anything a mere tidying up could fix. And this is me. I'm looking at what I found in the closet, which was like, I don't even know why. It was an ancient box of sanitary napkins. 
dust covered. It must have been there since the 1960s or something. Uh, and, and it was only getting worse. A friend of mine said, you have found the source of the river eBay. Uh. <laughs> but any time I mentioned assisted living, the reaction was extremely negative. And I have these little drawings of these places, like Sunset Gardens Retirement Community, End of the Trail Acres, <laughs> uh, Final Bridge Rest Home, and uh, somehow they were able to see through the euphemisms. Um, this one is called Last Stop, a luxury residence for people in their golden years. Um, finally, I got them to move to a place. The first few months were fairly uneventful, even though sometimes I had the feeling that my dad was less than 100% enthusiastic. <laughs> this place is a hellhole. <laughs> I knew it was not a hellhole. But even a top of the middle of the line or bottom of the top of the line place is still an institution, and institutions have rules. Every week there was a, a meet, I had to go to a meeting with the staff, and this woman is saying to me, your father doesn't like to bathe. Um, my mother never called it a hellhole, but she had opinions. We're not residents, we're inmates. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't easy, but they were adjusting. Your father had an egg in his pocket all day yesterday. Thank God it turned out to be hard boiled. <laughs> and uh, this is a typical afternoon at the place. Because um, I, I lived about 10 minutes away, so I got to visit them frequently. Um, Look, Dad, I brought you a cheese Danish. And he says, my favorite. And he turns to my mother and says, honey, care to share this with me? No, because I ate my lunch, unlike some people who were so busy socializing that they neglected their lunch, which is why some people are hungry now. And he says, I'll cut it into quarters. That way, if you change your mind, you can have some. As I told you, I'm still full from lunch. Then I'll cut it in half, and I'll eat one half, and I'll put the other half away for later. Watch. He'll forget, and he'll eat both halves. And then some people won't be hungry for dinner. <laughs> and here's me coming in, just like the brainiac of all brainiacs. Mom, I don't get why you're the boss of Dad's Danish ingestion. <laughs> and he says, actually, your mother's right. She's a brilliant woman. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> um, and this is also about when they were at the place. Um, I always made sure their door at the place had decor. There's a little hook on the back, see? Now, Indian corn, flowers, things like that. They didn't know what Indian corn was. You know, this is, they, they were in Brooklyn. The people didn't, um, and my mother says, it's very lovely, and my father's like looking at it, and it's like, what is that called again? <laughs> no wreaths, one had limits. Door decor was not an important part of my parents' old lives. Why would anybody want to call attention to their door? <laughs> Besides, it's a waste of money. But when in Rome, and in the last panel is, um, I didn't want other residents to think they were weird or anti-door decor. <laughs> and there's these two residents and two old, older ladies, and one says, I hear the chests are from New York. Um, now, uh, th these, this, these two cartoons I did when, uh, when my mother was in the hospital for two weeks. My father came to live with us, um, and uh, it was quite an interesting experience. Um, well, for one thing, uh, I mean, he could not be left alone in the apartment. This, was, this act I, is a little bit out of order. This is from before they um, came up to uh, the place. Uh, this was when they were still living in the apartment. Um, and they hadn't gone clothes shopping in a really long time. I mean, when you're like 93, you just don't look for reasons to leave the house, I think. You're, you know, they, my mother was unsteady on her feet, and it was just a lot of work. And their clothes were kind of like rags. I mean, I would send them things. When I cleaned out their apartment, I found, like, unused bags of things I had sent them from, like, Land's End. And, you know, I don't know, maybe they were... They, they didn't like them, or maybe they were saving them. I have no idea. But um, So I took my father. I said, Dad, your underwear is ancient. I'm going to take you to Kohl's to get some new stuff. 
So we're in the underwear aisle, and I realized he hadn't been shopping in such a long time that he wasn't used to this new style of underwear ad man, <laughs> where, um, <laughs> where like they're bare chested, their chests are waxed, and they've really been working out a lot. So they have pecs, like major, major pecs. And um, my father does this double take, and he goes, look at that ad. And I said, what? And he goes, it looks like those men have breasts. <laughs> and, uh, and then later in that same trip, I held up the sweater, and I said, Dad, what do you think of this sweater? I can't wear that. Why not? It's red. <laughs> Communism. <laughs> so weird. Um, Where are we going there? Uh, Here's what I used to think happened at the end. One day, old Mrs. McGillicuddy felt unwell, and she took to her bed. She stayed there for, oh, about three or four weeks, growing weaker by the day. One night, she developed something called a death rattle, and soon after that, she died. The end. Um, what I was starting to understand was that the middle panel was sometimes a lot more painful, humiliating, long-lasting, complicated, and hideously expensive. A few months after arriving at the place, my father broke his hip. When he developed painful bed sores that would not heal, he told my mother that he wanted to pack it in. I, sh I should say here that the reason he developed the bed sores was not because the nursing home was not good. It's because he had senile dementia, and he did this kind of thing with his heels. I mean, short of tying him to the bed, which we didn't want to do, um, it was not good. And he was... 95, and his body was, just could not heal. Um, he was tired of the work of staying alive and tired of the pain. My mother did not care for his defeatist attitude. I told Daddy he was going to come with me to 100 if I had to drag him kicking and screaming. <laughs> he entered hospice, which my mother didn't particularly approve of either. So the hospice lady has started coming around. She's very nice, but I told her, I don't want anyone coming around here with a long, sad face. I want positive thinking, not a bunch of people standing around singing Kumbaya. <laughs> anyway, my father did die um, not long after breaking his hip. Um, and my mother lived another two years with many, many ups and downs, um, which I write more about in the book. but. Um, Towards the end of her life, she started, it was very strange. She had some dementia, but it wasn't consistent. It was very confusing because she'd be, you know, we'd be talking about something in the news. She'd ask me, you know, very specific questions about my kids, what they were doing. You know, my daughter was taking banjo lessons, and she seemed to be quite with it. And then she would suddenly, like, launch into a story. Um, like, like this one, and I, I started keeping track of them. I started writing them down, uh, not knowing what I would do with them, but they were so strange, and th this is what I do. I mean, I write things down, so this one is called Dead Dad. I mean, this is like in the middle of like a normal conversation. She suddenly say, your father died before you were born, when I was pregnant with you. My father, Harry, said he would buy me a house and he would live with us and babysit you while I was at work. And I said, Mom, that's not true. Yes, it is, and I should know. <laughs> um, this one is called Ass Full of Buckshot. <laughs> there was a break-in at the place. All the men were moved over to the women's side. I shot the intruder with my BB gun. I gave him an ass full of buckshot. <laughs> I'd like to stand him on a stage, pull down his pants, and take out the pellets one by one in front of everybody. <laughs> And uh, this one is unusual adoption. Did I ever tell you about how the Miltons got Paula? Now, I had heard about the Miltons get, getting Paula, and uh, uh, different names, but this was not what I had heard. Uh, <laughs> they went out shopping, and when they got back to their car, there was a grocery bag leaning against the wheel, and inside the bag was a baby. <laughs> um, I was on a launch, and a woman who was naked down to her pupic got stabbed in the heart by a flying swordfish. A terrible way to die. Maybe you dreamed it. Nope, I was right there. <laughs> and, and this one, uh, some of her stories involved real estate 
in Manhattan. <laughs> and they were kind of great in a way. I kind of got why she had these, I don't know what they were, what, you know, living dreams, waking dreams, I don't know. But she knew that in some part of me that I, you know, dreamed about having, you know, a little apartment in Manhattan someday moving back there or whatever. So this story is, the Board of Education gave me an apartment in their building. And I'm like, oh, where is that? Um, 550 Park Avenue. <laughs> oh, it's as big as a ballroom, the entire first floor. It could hold 100 people. To have an apartment in that building, you have to be a person of authority. When my brother Aaron visits, Aaron had predeceased her by a couple of years, he can stay there. It has lots of windows and a private bathroom. Um, of all the stories, I like this one the best. When you were around four, Daddy and I took you to see Uncle Tom's cabin at Brooklyn College. When Simon Legree was whipping old Uncle Tom, you jumped out of your seat and ran to the stage and yelled at him to stop hurting Uncle Tom. You said, you're a bad, bad man. And then you took away his whip. <laughs> you almost ruined the play. <laughs> um, did not. Um, and then at a certain point, the story stopped. And uh, she was moving into her final months. I, you know, I didn't know if that was true because she had been in hospice before and I had, as Art Buckwald, recently, not recently, when he said he failed hospice the first time, um, <laughs> which is, you know, it was pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, she came out of hospice. She lived another two years and then she started to go downhill more seriously and the story stopped and I would go visit her and she was mostly sleeping and I wanted to be with her even though our relationship had been you know complicated I wanted to be with her and I wanted to look at her and remember her and um, I did a, a lot of drawings um, and these are these are them some of them And this is the last one um, I did after she passed away. Um, the aide called me, and I got there a few minutes after she died. Um, and then, you know, all this official business happens, and, you know, they have to go, and they have to get this person and that person and call this person and that person, and they left me with her. And um, I, I do what I do. I mean, I, I, I draw, so I drew her. Um, Anyway, I wish that at the end of life, when things were truly done, there was something to look forward to, something more pleasure-oriented, perhaps opium or heroin. <laughs> so you became addicted. So what? <laughs> All you can eat ice cream parlors for the extremely aged, big art picture books and music, extreme palliative care for when you've had it with everything else. The x-rays, the MRIs, the boring food, and the pills that don't do anything at all. Would that be so bad? Um, and uh, now I'm going to go back to cartoons because it's fun. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, this is uh, dousing for coffee. Um, it's very silly. This is the Nancy Drew mysteries, the later years. Um, Nancy Drew and the missing house keys. Um, I know, I left them right there. Um, Nancy Drew and the mystery of the eight pounds. <laughs> How did I gain eight pounds? I eat nothing. And Nancy Drew in The Secret of the Computer. You and I are going to be great friends. Um, uh, this is the Velcros at home. It's just like. Uh, uh, this is Donna Karen's nightmare. Um, um, uh, well. Um, uh, in acupressure points. This is a, ouch, quit it. This isn't helping at all. Will you please stop? No, leave that alone. Chuck you Farley. Stop touching me. Cut that out. Don't an uncle. Um, uh, this is in a just world. We have a, I don't know if you can see it. There's uh, caps 
uh, the kid is wearing a dunce cap, and the 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 uh, teacher is wearing a bitch cap. So, um, uh, this is the delusional world of the free-range chicken. This is the life, isn't it? You said it, sister. I'm going to explore that big, wide world out there. Ain't no stopping us now. Um, it's the Holy Trinity. Um, um, this is a. Uh, uh, um, this is uh, the vain but realistic queen. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who, if she lost 10 pounds and had her eyes and her neck done and had the right haircut, could in her age group be the fairest one of all? Um, uh, this is... Uh, I love those end of the world guys. I just love them. Um, and uh, this is uh, tuned in, turned on, dropped out, dropped in, worked out, saved up, dropped dead. <laughs> and that is the end. And Um, clearly, if your experience is so, my experience is so close to yours, and I think a lot of it is what my husband and I used to call the Jewish guilt death trip, <laughs> which we're all on. And I wondered whether you knew that Kenahara, oh. which is the universal. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, ward off the evil kid. Eye. Oh, yeah. It yeah, means yeah. no cholera. No. <gasps> That's what that really? means. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. Thank you. Live and learn. No cholera. Wow. I thought it was just like ward, just something to do with the evil eye. Yes, warding off the evil eye. No cholera. Wow. Good to know. Yeah. Um, any other uh, questions? Oh, yes. Oh, I know. I feel like I'm looking at a plane or something. It's really... <laughs> The question was, what did my parents think of my drawings? They were enormously proud. My, they were uh, longtime New Yorker subscribers. And they were very, very proud. I don't think they and I had the same sense of humor. Um, uh, and uh, my father used to carry around this cartoon in his wallet. Not one of mine. It came from the Saturday Review. and. Uh, it was of a guy on his psychiatrist's couch saying, I feel inadequate because I don't understand the cartoons in The New Yorker. <laughs> and, and, you know, at the drop of a hat, he would pull this out and show it to people. So uh, I, they were very proud. I don't think, you know, as I said, that we always, you know, got each other's stuff. But anyway, yes. Um, the question is about the New Yorker Festival, whether I'd be there. I, it's completely up to them. I, I'm guessing not, because I was there two years ago, and they kind of like to you know, change up the roster and spread it around and stuff. Um, yes? Um, so how much um, ageism do you think we have in our society today? <laughs> um, ageism? There's mm -hmm. a lot of ageism, and we're not, we are just not set up at all, I don't think, for taking care of old people in this country. I th it's horrible. I, and putting my parents in a place was not great, but it was the, less, the least terrible of the alternatives that were out there. It was, it, it, but it, it is awful, and I, and I don't know what the answer to it is, except that we do live in, it seems to me that we live in a society where people don't really talk about what it's like to be really old and they would just assume you know that you just disappear that you just mm -hmm. you know it's it's not good do do the gray panthers still exist how can we get the oh. gray panthers going <laughs> <laughs> i have no idea i don't know <laughs> oh yes what do your children think of your cartoons ah they they actually like them they're they're funny they're they're funny people um 
And uh, yeah, we we send each other, you know, funny things, you know, links. My we send each other things from the Onion or, um, you know, odd cartoons or whatever. <laughs> uh, so they're very funny. And uh, they like this book. I let them read it. So. Um, yes. Hey, Roz. Um, Roz, my name's Matt Mendelson. For I've been sending you <gasps> oh, a holiday yeah. a holiday card oh, for like twenty you. years now. Like through the mail. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's really funny. My wife doesn't get it. She's like, "Why do you send Roz Chest a holiday card? She's They're not so part great. of our family." They're beautiful. And, They're beautiful. You're and a photographer, that, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah anyway. My brother writes for the New Yorker. Yes. Um, yes. And I couldn't. I could never tell her why I send you a holiday card. And I don't know. And then I was talking to my seatmate over here before, and. Um, I said, oh, you look like you could be Roz's sister. And she said, well, we do have the same mother. And for a split second, oh. <laughs> for a split second, I thought she was serious. And then she, I realized what she was saying, and that's the experience. I remember the very first cartoon that I was, um, it was mid-'80s, and it was The Anxious Gourmet. And it, oh. it was recipes for the, the Anxious Gourmet. Yeah. And the first step was get or pay somebody to light the oven yes. for you. And I th <laughs> yes. I thought, how does this woman have my mother? I just didn't <laughs> understand it. And so for all these years, you have been such a big part of our family. I mean, oh you have the God. Trinity there, and oh, we have our own. Thank you. I, I love getting your cards. Oh, I'm they're, so they're, glad. So I'm so glad. they're so great. They're so great. You know, next so to Mookie you. Wilson and Tom Seaver, you are the third part of the Mendelssohn <laughs> Trinity. And I just wanted to say we love you. We love oh you. We love God. you. Oh, my God. Well, thanks. Thank you. It's good to meet you. Uh, yes. Oh, wait. Oh, where? Oh, I don't know. Sorry. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, here. Okay. Sorry. I'm having difficulty in my own experience of reading these graphic novels. They tend to be memoirs rather than novels of fiction. Yeah. And I think it's because they're memoirs rather than novels of fiction. Yeah, we're talking. Memoirs are by women. Well. Yeah, well, we were talking about the the I I don't the mem graphic memoir things that are not really graphic novels. I mean, this is not a graphic novel; it's a graphic graphic memoir. And then about what what was the que question? When I, when I pick up well, okay, graphic books. When I pick yeah. up one of these graphic books, they tend they always seem very often to me to be memoirs rather than novels. And do they does the does the graphic book lend itself to being memoirs rather than a um, the question was wh whether the graphic format lends itself to being a memoir rather than a novel. I, I don't think so. I mean, you think about like those, uh, I mean, there's all those like fantasy graphic novels and stuff. And there's so many different, I feel like it just lends itself to whatever the author there wants to do. The, the what? There are shelves of the Shel movie. Yeah, yeah, there's tons. There's a million anything. Do you want to choose? Well, I, no, I, I okay, think you probably can, that might be okay. You well, might. why don't we go to okay. there, okay. to there, anybody okay, else? Okay, you, you, you pick. There, I'm, getting there. <laughs> I'm getting very anxious about this. Okay. Okay, we'll go to this lady who's had her oh, hand okay, yes. on the left. Oh, okay, yes. Okay. Oh, here. She's okay, good, yes, yes good, good. That, okay, that sorry. Okay. Okay. Oh, he's amazing, Chris Ware. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I feel like you know uh, the question was about uh, I guess like starting you know doing. I know that when my stuff was very uh, different from what was in the New Yorker when I, they started running me. I mean, to the point where years later, my editor told me that not only had some people canceled their subscriptions, <laughs> um, but so a couple of the one of the older artists had asked him whether he owed my parents money. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, I I don't know, you know I, I I don't know. Here you have to do this. You have to do the picking. <laughs> okay. Sir. How much did your editors dare to edit uh, this latest work of yours? Criticizing or saying I don't know about this cartoon or I don't know about that caption. Um, the question was how much editing did this book? Uh, have the the uh, can't we talk about something more pleasant? Um, my editor, uh, she 
really helped me with things like making sure I wasn't repeating myself, putting things in the right order, editing more for clarity, um, which is really, really important because sometimes when you're very, very close to something, you can't see, you know, you said this before, now you're saying it again. Um, so she was really good at just making sure that um, I wasn't jumping around too much and that it was clear. But she didn't, like, choose the cartoons or anything. That was all my pick. So she really let me let me do it the way I wanted. In fact, they had a, another cover, and, you know, I, I wanted this title, and they had some other idea. But they were very good. I loved working with her, actually. I wanted to thank you for your work, which, like everyone else, I've loved for a thousand years here. Um, but one of the things I found most poignant in this work is that you're expressing it as an as an only child, and I've had a similar experience, and I'm wondering if going through this, did you ever imagine siblings like I did, Mitch and Gail, who left me alone in this horrible <laughs> abyss of, of what you've described far more eloquently? So. Um, are you, you're asking like if I ever like imagine like having siblings to help. I, well, you know what? It's, it's a, I feel like there's pluses and minuses on both sides mm -hmm. because I know people with siblings and it can sometimes be a help and it can sometimes lead to such terrible acrimony. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm doing more, you do nothing, blah, 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 blah. Or like, we should, you know, take mommy and do this. No, I totally disagree, we should do that. And, you know, people get into fights where they're not even speaking with each other. So, <laughs> you know, it's, I think in some ways it's harder and in, to do it yourself and in some ways it's easier. So, I don't know, <laughs> really very, thank you. The mic. Mm -hmm. We have only a, ch a chance for a few more questions, so please keep your questions short, and we'll get to as many of you as we can. Short mm -hmm. questions. Okay. Well, I love your stuff, although it's disconcerting how often you get inside my head. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I've planted little bugs <laughs> all over your apartment. <laughs> I have, a, there's a cartoon you did, I think it's called The Perils of Prosperity, all about. Oh, with all the stuff? Yeah, all yeah. the stuff. Yeah. I, I got it when I was living in Ukraine. I framed it and uh, it's traveled everywhere, but <laughs> after the second flood, a few, it's not in the best of shape. Are there uh, ways to get new copies of yeah. your Oh, stuff? you have to go to cartoonbank.com and you can get a print. Cartoon Cartoonbank.com. Cartoon so Thank they you. sell <laughs> prints of all the cartoons in the New Yorker. No, only mine, only mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um. <clears throat> have you thought about your Oh. Have you thought about your own old age, and what have you made plans for your old age? Um, what I, I what think about it all the time, uh, so. and no, I have not made plans. <laughs> <laughs> old age? That, that's so far away. <laughs> but yeah, it's. I mean, it's, have you spoken to your kids? What if you get Alzheimer's? What? I mean, um, what, you know. <laughs> uh, they're just gonna have to deal. No, uh, no. I I think I do think about it all the time, and I really think I should do. I mean, something. God forbid. Yeah, what, what I'm saying. but you yeah. know, I, it's, it's got to clean out some of the jar lids. I think. <laughs> no, it's it's a it's good. Ma'am, did you have a question at the mic? No. Okay. My, actually, my my question was sort of answered, but I was going to ask you about being an only child dealing with this versus siblings, and I was going to say that my observation with my friends has been it's been easier on the the only children. Because yeah. I have seen some really nasty yeah. altercations with, with I siblings. have too. I have so. too. So anyway. I think we have time for one last question, <laughs> ma'am, in oh. the middle. Oh. Oh. America tells you you have to have like white teeth. It's weird. <laughs> anyway, um, we're done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.